The pharmaceutical industry loves overweight and unhealthy people. That is their consumer base. So if you're fit and healthy, they don't like you. All right, guys, I'm going to read to you some quotes from uh, Dr. Fatima Stanford. She's a member of the Biden um, USDA's Dietary Guidelines Ad uh, Advisory Committee. So she works for the administration. And she's recently been on 60 Minutes talking about obesity. You guys know obesity is this growing um, kind of chronic issue that we've seen in modern societies and it affects America quite, quite a lot. So here's what she said, literally, those are her words, these are her words in um, the 60 Minute interview. She said that having obesity is due to genetics. The number one cause of obesity is genetics. Okay. Mm. It, having obese parents increases your risk or gives you a 50 to 80% risk of being obese yourself. That means if you are born to parents that have obesity, you have a 50 to 85% likelihood of having the disease yourself. And then she said in there that obesity is a brain disease because your brain tells you how much to eat and how much to store. It's a brain disease. It is? It's a brain disease. And the brain tells us how much to eat and how much to store. What do you guys think about that, Adam? What do you think? I mean, I think there's a couple ways to, to look at this. One, um, I don't believe it to be true, mm. but let's say it was true. Would I, would I approach it this way as far as like sharing it to people? Because I mean, I think of like having um, a client, actually I think of having like my, a child. If I had a child, um, let's say that had a disability and um, he's coming to me and is is down or frustrated because he's struggling to do something because he has this disability. And am I the type? Am I the type of father that would be like, "Yeah, son, sucks for you. You know, you didn't uh, you didn't get dealt good cards, and so you can't do those things." You know, or would I try to reframe his situation and empower him and motivate him? To, to help him regardless of the situation or the cards that he was dealt. And so my, my opinion, when I hear something like that, instead of trying to get in this argument and get in the weeds, like most people will, you know, that will start to try and argue the science of who's more right in this situation. I think even if that other side that I disagree with is right, it's still not how I would approach the situation. So yeah, I I gotta kind of interject in, in terms of like I just none of those statements are factual. So I can't have those kind of arguments of like, you know, playing the other person's role in this. In we haven't seen any examples of this in history of obesity being a genetic factor. Yeah. So this is a new problem that we're addressing that is now has a new spin to it that we're hearing that is very alarming to me. I, 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 I'm super alarmed by it. Um, I, you know, first I want to address the 50 to 80% likelihood of being obese. If you have obese parents, it, there's two ways of looking at it. one is it's genetic. So your parents are obese. Therefore you're going to be obese. You have the same, the same genes. The other way to look at it is that if you're a kid and you grow up in a household where people lead a lifestyle that leads to obesity, you by default also will lead and learn to lead a lifestyle that will cause obesity. Yeah. So it doesn't at all, um, in my opinion, discredit the lifestyle argument. Um, now to what you said, Justin, obesity is a modern, uh, problem. I mean, you go back a hundred years and it wasn't prevalent at all. Um, now genetics plays somewhat of a role, but obesity was almost non-existent if you go back 100 well, years, can, I mean, years. Can't you make the case when it comes to epigenetics, you can make the case that genetics always play some sort of a role. Everything. In intelligence, success in life, uh, longevity, um, strength. Um, yeah, there's always, always a mean, combination of that and right, nature. That, right. that, that, that is always factored into every... So that, that goes back to my point of like highlighting or pointing that out, even if it was true, which I don't believe it mm -hmm. to be true, mm -hmm. is still irrelevant to me as far as a, a, a case to even bring up. So your big right. argument is, and I, I, I see what you're saying, I agree with you. Your big argument is it's... Not only is it disempowering, but potentially there's a reason why they would want us to be unempowered. Like, what's the goal? Yeah, like, why would you? Well, why would money, you? Want what's the desired money. outcome of that statement, and to come out with that type of money? Uh, money. If you can't see, if you cannot see where this is going, you're an idiot. 
That's, you really are an idiot if you cannot see where this is going. It's like Big Pharma has proven this to us time and time again, and they are not interested in what's best for you. They're in, they are driven, okay? They have shareholders, and they, they are driven by being profitable and making money. And if they have any sort of relationship with news and media and have the, the ability to, I mean, it sounds really bad to say this, but I mean, you almost can't blame them if they're, if they're in the business of making money and that's what they care about first and foremost to go about it this way. It's, it's, it's like, it's the perfect way to set, the, set the, set the table for right. what's to come. Well, It's baked into the system. I think it would be another way to say it, right? Mm. Like if your industry, um, is revolves around treating chronic illnesses or treating issues through medications, then your target consumer is just, I mean, just by default, it is not fit and healthy people because fit and healthy people don't need those kinds of treatments. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then you're looking at how can we in increase our market share? How can we make the market that we're serving much larger? Well, if more people get fit and healthy, it shrinks your market. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway, the RGB bundle. MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you got the RGB bundle for free. Also, we got a sale going on this month. It's February, which means we have a new promotion. MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit. All three of them, 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up and use the code FEB50 for the discount. All right, here comes the show. If less people are fit and healthy, you have a larger market that you can advertise to. You spent, you brought up money. Let's talk about that for a second. In 2020, all TV ad spending, all TV ad spending, 75% of it yeah. was the pharmaceutical industry. So not just like a big chunk of it, the majority, majority. of every commercial yeah. went to, the, the revenue went to the pharmaceutical industry. Globally, the pharma industry is worth $1.4 trillion, trillion dollars. And the, and the big blockbuster companies are American companies. In fact, almost 50% of that 1.4 trillion uh, is the, is what the U.S. pharmaceutical industry uh, brings in. Okay, wow. so U.S. pharmaceutical industry brings in almost half of the world hmm. when it comes to um, that kind of revenue. They've spent over a hundred million dollars on lobbying, by the way, in 2022. Meaning they they go and talk to politicians and try to get legislation passed. And and by the way, the the, the doctor that I quoted, so, I, I mentioned, she's part of Biden's administration. Yeah. So. That, that's the other part of this is is people would say, well, why would the government want this? I mean, there's a there there we're already so, in relations with yes. them for all kinds of uh, I mean, all kinds of deals that have already been made. So this just feels like another deal they've made uh, to um, you know kind of combine the two forces together of government and pharmaceutical. So companies. what's what's the solution to this? Do you guys believe that? a pharmaceutical company should be for profit. And, and if they, if you do believe that, then do you also believe that they should be allowed to market and advertise just like any other for profit business? And would that, and potentially getting rid of that, would that solve some of this problem? I don't think uh, removing the profit incentive would make this better. In fact, I think it would make it worse uh, because without profit, then we don't have research and development. And I, I do want to be clear too that the pharmaceutical industry um, also does a lot of good. Mm -hmm. So removing the profit incentive means a lot of people die um, without new drugs and new developments. And they can treat um, many diseases quite effectively that we couldn't treat, you know, just 50 years ago. Maybe the maybe the the answer is to prevent them from advertising to consumers. Maybe the uh, the answer is to eliminate their ability to lobby government. I'm not sure. I do think a good start though is to bring awareness, mm -hmm. right? To to when you hear this doctor on 60 Minutes telling you it's not your fault, uh, it's your genetics. Oh, and it's a brain disease, which is strange. It's mm -hmm. your brain telling you what to do. Okay, well, my brain tells me to do everything. That's a really weird way to position it. Uh, you have to ask yourself, what, what is the motivating factor behind this? Because obesity, again, didn't exist 
just a few generations ago. It's growing at a very rapid well, rate. We don't evolve that fast. By you saying that it's attached to genetics in your brain, you open the door for everybody. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you everybody is now a customer. Yes. Everybody yeah. is a customer now by us attaching this to genetics and to the brain. Yes. So that is the part to me where you you got to be you open your eyes and go like, this is what's coming next. First, we 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 sell you on the idea, and this is not some fucking conspiracy theory. They 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 this did like a, they did this with they did it with <laughs> opiates. They, yes, they they did it with Adderall and you shit see like where that. the opiate crisis is at the moment. Yes, it's, it's out of control. Yes, so that first they'll come out with all kinds of stuff to support how it it these these are the reasons why you're obese and it's not your fault. You have a chemical imbalance, or you 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 got dealt a shitty hand of genetics. But don't worry. You know, Pfizer or so and so has got something for you to help you out, to yeah. put you on a level playing field as everybody else. Well, if, and here it comes. If you're a, if you're a pharmaceutical company, and you're looking at um, symptoms to control or treat, right? If you could pick one thing that contributes to lots of things, so if you could just pick one thing that would that now you could treat, that's a huge market, but also leads to all these other things. I can't think of a better thing than obesity because obesity contributes to almost any chronic health issue, both psychological Mm -hmm. and physiological that we can think of. Obesity makes all those things worse. So it's a massive market. Look, obese people just plain and simple. They need more medications. Um, And the medications, by the way, that fit and healthy people need are not big money-making medications. So you think of certain medications like insulin for someone with diabetes or you know, asthma medication or certain things that, you know, might get worse with, um, you know, obesity, but some of them are really just genetic. Those are typically generic and expensive. When you look at all the, um, the, the things that fall under the umbrella of obesity, and if you make obesity a treatable disease itself without any of the other stuff, um, you're looking at blockbuster drugs. Well, if I'm a company and I, lo- I go through this pandemic and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, one of the biggest contributors to people's fears in terms of like at the most risk was the obese community. Mm-hmm. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, there's a big effort right now to, I'm sure, move away from, um, you know, being obese, whether that's through fitness, whether that's through nutrition, whether it's just looking at research and trying to figure out like, you know, how can I be less at risk? And now we're addressing obesity in terms of it being a genetic thing that all of a sudden now we can solve. Yeah. I think, um, if you, if you really, I mean, it's, and it's not hard to see this, right? Obviously, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry, um, just the way the system is designed, this is their target audience or their target consumers. Then you have politicians who are heavily influenced by one of the largest industries in the world. And it's no surprise, right, that government is influenced heavily by large corporations for things like legislation and policy. Um, That's been happening for a long time. But there's also this, which is politicians do much better when they can make a problem seem like it's not yours, but they have the solution, mm-hmm. okay? So think of it this way. If you had two politicians, and let's say that the the number one wedge issue was obesity. It's, it never is, but let's just say it was. Let's say, you know, election season's coming, and on the top of the list of things that Americans are concerned with, it's not economy, it's not safety, it's not any of that stuff. It is obesity. And you had one politician who goes up there and they go, look, here's the deal, everybody. Obesity is a big problem. Lots of people are dying from it's it. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's genetics. Your brain is telling you what to do. There's nothing you can do about it. But if you elect me, we are going to go. We're going to have a war on obesity, and we're going to subsidize drugs that will solve obesity for you. And I'm going to make sure every American who's obese mm-hmm. gets these drugs for free. They could take them, and they will no longer be obese. And it's going to resonate Through so paper, hard paper with money. so many people yeah. because it's the majority of people that suffer from this and or are connected to somebody That's that right. Does. And then on the other side, a politician comes up. So now he goes, and then the next person comes up, and they go, hey, everybody. It's like, yes, yeah, so obesity is a problem, but it's your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's how you eat. It's how you move. It's the way you live your life. You totally have the power to change this, and I hate to tell you this, but the government can't do anything to help you. Listen, you we, are not getting elected. Listen, right? we, so nobody's going to vote for we you. We saw this example yeah. with the pandemic. I mean, and now, by the way, you're seeing all the articles coming out to support how important a healthy diet, vitamin yeah. D, and nutrition and exercise has to do with with building your building your immune system and putting you in the best position possible to fight off or survive COVID. Yet none of that was communicated. 
in the very beginning of all this, or for the first year and a half, two years. Now it's all coming afterwards. Yeah, after they've already made billions of dollars off of the vaccine, like this is the same type of deal. It's just like they're going to hold back the information that really matters right now. They're going to promote some other mm -hmm. bullshit message because they have an agenda, and the agenda well, is to set the table for mm -hmm. what's coming for you as well, a solution. Let me go down the list. Maybe, Doug, you could scroll down a little bit because I, I took notes because there's a lot here. So – these are the things that we know for a fact, not that far down, that we know for a fact that obesity uh, contributes to, okay? So obesity, this is a fact, this is all established. Obesity by itself significantly increases the risk of high blood pressure, okay? So if you're obese, your risk of high blood pressure is 65 to 78%, okay? Now think of all the medications and drugs that are... Uh, that are around that are to treat blood pressure, high mm -hmm. blood pressure, a lot. In fact, high blood pressure medication is one of the most common medications that people take. Um, lipid profile dysfunction, cholesterol, right? LDL, HDL. We ever since the invention of statins, because if your yep. blood, if your cholesterol numbers don't look good according to their ranges, taking a statin, I mean, it just basically yeah. makes your numbers look good. Statins are some of the most profitable medications there are uh, on the market. Cancer. Cancer, uh, it's been estimated that r roughly 10% of all cancers can be, 10% is a lot. If you look at all the cancers that exist in, in America that have happened, 10% of them can be attributed to uh, obesity. Some of them much higher, like liver and kidney cancers, uh, twice as high your risk of getting those if you're obese. Endometrial uh, cancers, seven times as high. Now, how, much, how many medications, drugs, uh, hospital stays, doctor visits are connected to cancer. Mm -hmm. Like I had a family member, you know, fight cancer for a year and a half. Do you know how expensive oh, yeah. that process was? Yeah. I mean, just it's outrageous. The, the visits, the stays, the antidepressants, the anxiety medication. People don't they think, oh, you just take medication or drugs for cancer, like chemo. No, no, no. There's also severe anxiety, severe depression. There's therapy. There's doctor visits. Then there's hospital visits when it starts to get real bad. The costs associated with just cancer and the money available or, or that people can make or this, these uh, corporations can make with cancer is massive. Heart disease. Think of all the drugs and surgical interventions that are related to heart disease. You go get a double bypass or you have to get when your arteries, you know, you get a stint put in there mm -hmm. or all the medications that are connected to heart disease, right? Stroke. And then uh, in diabetes. Diabetes is, is one of the number one chronic health issues, yeah. but it doesn't just stop there. Depression and anxiety also are greatly increased the risks with simple obesity. Okay. And obviously the lifestyle that, that is connected to obesity, depression and anxiety are two of the most treated psychiatric conditions that we have. So when you add all of those up and we know that obesity contributes greatly to those, you're looking at a massive market. Now in the past, you had medications that were for each one of those. So if you go in and you're obese, but you don't have high blood pressure, your cholesterol seems okay, you don't have heart disease or one of those things. So you're like, your BMI is a little high, but you don't have those things. You really don't qualify. In fact, to qualify for obesity drugs, you had to be severely like really like off the charts. But what they're trying to do now is make simple obesity a disease that you can't do anything about yourself. Now you can take a medication just for obesity and increase your the size of the market for obesity because what you're doing is you're sending a message and I want I want to be clear here this is a message they're pushing now it doesn't sink in for a generation or so so they're making the push us who've been around are looking at this going you're an idiot this yeah. is whatever it's your kids and then their kids who are going to be raised with this whatever you want to call it it's a direct call shot at preventative methods right it's it's a direct shot at our industry <laughs> what we do how we help people so that's i think what's so alarming about it is you know how many people are going to be impacted by that and use that as you know something for them to uh, base how they're going to go forward with their health how many times have we said on the podcast that the solution for obesity or the most important factor when it comes to health and fitness is all about the mental psychological. Yeah. It's not the steps. It's not the, that's macros. why even it's if, huge. even if this, even if they could back up and prove the science, I, that would not be my argument. I think everyone's going to get lost in the weeds in that argument. And I think that's actually part of the strategy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think a part of the strategy is like how, okay, if we connect it to brain we connect and you it could to, twist numbers. Yeah, and data, exactly. Yeah. If we connected to brain and genetics, 
which is basically influences everything, okay? We can easily manipulate the stats to convince or at least fool a good percentage of people or people go like, that's just way too much for me to think about. I'm going to believe what this doctor is telling me and just go down that path. I think that's the wrong hmm. argument. Yeah. I still think that even if that were true, that would not be the way that I would handle it if it was my child. If my child was going through that, I would net and and, it, and they did get bad genetics. They got for some reason, and they were de destined to have a much harder time with losing weight than I ever had to deal with, or my wife did. And he just got you know Max got the bad deal. I still wouldn't yeah. present it to him that way. I would never. I would never do that because it yeah. doesn't empower it's him. Disempowering, very sure. very much so. Yeah. And it's a it's a losing battle to do that. And it's silly to think that that's the the answer. Let me ask you this though, Sal. I know there's somebody who's listening right now who who is nodding their head in agreement on yeah all this stuff with that, but then what they would say is they would blame this on capitalism. Mm. What is your point on and and do you believe do you believe this is a a flaw in capitalism? Do you believe it's to blame and that a you know a socialistic type of structure would be better or some sort of a nonprofit setup for it would be better like. I know somebody is thinking that right now as they're listening to us rattle off all this shit. Well, yeah, because um, there are not that many obese people in North Korea or Venezuela or in the Soviet Union. So, you know, is capitalism to blame? I think it's more like um, prosperity, choices, and markets that give us what we want. So, I mean, I guess if you want to make the argument that we wouldn't be obese if we were in North Korea, yeah, but you'd have other problems, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you'd be starving. I think really what capitalism does is it just gives us what we want. And the problem is we don't always know what we need. It's just what we want. So what markets have done is they've given us, and we'll get to this, you know, maybe later in the episode, but they've given us convenient, super tasty, long shelf life food. So fast, tastes super good. Um, and it lasts a long time. So I don't have to throw it out, right? I could just put it in the, uh, in the pantry and then grab it whenever I want. And that's what people want. And so we created food like that. What else do we want? We don't want to move. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's hard. I don't want to get up and walk somewhere. It's work, and, extra and, work. I don't want to, you know, do, I, I'd rather just sit here and not do anything. And so capitalism's like, here you go. Here's innovations that allow you to do that. Here's DoorDash. Here's food to your door. Here's, you know, washing machines and dishwashers and devices. That, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think what it is, is, is our world has changed rapidly and dramatically but we're still left with bodies that evolved to live in a completely different environment. So obesity is a side effect of that. Now, I, I do think that, I mean, we still have lots of control over it, but being fit and healthy is no longer the default. It's now something you have to choose because the default now is being obese. So when people blame capitalism on some of these problems, to me, it's silly because it's like, well, what's the alternative? Do you want to be thrown? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I could take obese people and put them, lock them in a room and give them only the food that I want them to eat and make them walk on a treadmill eight, eight, you know, eight hours a day. But is that really what we want? Well, you know what I think about when somebody does that or says something like that is I think about the, one of the more impactful things I ever heard Tony Robbins say to a kid that was complaining about their childhood with their parent and had a really terrible dad. It was abusive and all these things and stuff like that. And he, he was, I was not ready for him to say what he said to this, this girl. And he says, you have to, if you're going to blame him for that, for those bad things that happen in your life, you have to blame him for everything then all the good things and all the other, and like really reframe yeah. the way. And so I feel the same way about if you're going to shit on it being capitalism fault and okay, arguably that you're, that could be true or it's partially true for sure then you also have to blame it for all the good that is created in this yeah. country too. And is it, is it better or worse than any other type of a situation? Yeah. So, kind of like that Jordan Peterson talk that we right. just saw of being able Look. to see the duality. It, it, we, you know, ideologies tend to, you know, attach themselves to a, you know, handful of facts, whether they be negative or positive, but then leave out the other side always right. so they can prove their and point. both are true. It's right. just, which one do you want to focus on the most? Yeah. And, and that's sort of how you run your operating system of how you look at the world. I mean, it's it's like there's going to be po potential negatives, there's going to be potential positives. Do the positives outweigh the negatives? This is what you always have to assess. Yeah, look, I uh, my dad grew up very poor in Sicily, okay? Um, I would rather live now where I have to choose to go lift heavy things in a gym 
versus the way he grew up where he had no choice. If he didn't go lift heavy things and break his back, then he had no money and he couldn't support himself and his family couldn't survive. So, right. you know, would I, do I want forced workouts or, choose, or be able to choose workouts? Do I want forced diet? You know, there was a statistic from Venezuela when they, the average Venezuelan lost something like 20 pounds when they went full socialism. So it's like, oh, the greatest diet of all time. I mean, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so so that's silly. I think we're in this position and we need to become more aware. And, you know, look, I, by the way, this is why it's so such a powerful argument what they're doing. Because you guys know this. We all know this. If you're somebody who struggled with this, because lifestyle is a struggle. You know, lifestyle is everything. So I don't want to make light of how challenging this is. We're not just talking about like one thing that you do. This is your lifestyle. And if you grew up this way, and this is the way everyone is around you, changing that is really, really hard. It is not easy. So there's a lot of people, most people, again, you guys know this, who struggle with this, who are like, I have tried 10 times. Yeah. I've lost weight. I've gained it back. I've tried this diet. I've tried that diet. I signed up for this workout. I did that kind of workout. And it's just, it's not working for me. So then somebody comes along and says, you know why? Because it's your genetics. It's not your fault. That's going to feel so true. Yeah. yeah. That's going to totally feel true. Yeah. yeah. Now back to the psychological piece. Again, the, I could work with, and I'd love your guys' opinion on this. I can work with anything with a client who's trying to lose weight, but there's one thing I cannot work with that it would be impossible for me. And it's the person who comes to me who refuses to be empowered, who says there, yeah, there's no nothing self, I can do no about it. No self-belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if they can't do anything about it, first of all, they, don't, they wouldn't hire me because to hire a trainer means you already believe that you can. But the person who believes they can't do anything about it, there's nothing I could well, do. Because when they say that, it's true. <laughs> like, where do you go with that? Like that, that message that's already being received and they're telling themselves that, um, and they're not going to put any effort into it, then you're going to get the outcome that you're already predicting in your own mind. Yeah. Totally. All right. So what I want to do, because this is happening right now, and I think this is a push and we're going to see it happen for the next five years is I would like to predict now what's going to happen so that when it happens, people can go back and be like, okay, like they called it. And this is not a coincidence. We could see this and maybe it'll help people become more aware. Yeah. Right. So first thing is that they're going to create and push the narrative that obesity is something you have no control over. That's happening right now. Um, next, part, will, next will come the studies to support it. Yeah. So part of that is uh, telling people it's not your fault and then they'll take data, they'll twist it. For example, if you have overweight parents, your odds of being obese are 50 to 80% higher. Sounds like it could be a genetic thing if you don't figure that it's also lifestyle because you live with your parents. They yeah. raise you, right? So they could take that data, twist it, and make it sound like, oh, if parents are this way, then I should be this way. Just like if my parents are short, then I'll be short. No, that's not how this specific thing works. The other half of that, that narrative, is to demonize. So here's what they do with propaganda. They'll put out a false message, and then they'll demonize the correct message. So part of the narrative that they're going to push, and this is happening now, and you're going to see more of this, is uh, gyms are bad places. They're fat phobic. Mm -hmm. It's hating yourself if you're trying to lose weight. Uh, fat phobia is a thing. It's not body acceptance. Um, it's toxic masculinity. It's all these negative things. So what they're use, aggression. Yeah, you name it. Th they're going to demonize white supremacists, white supremacists, roots, roots, yeah. Yes, racist. Yeah. They're going to demonize people or uh, ways of getting yourself healthy. Diets are restrictive. Diets are oppressive. Exercise is terrible. Gyms are terrible places. So that's all going to be combined with this current push that uh, obesity is something that you have no control over. So that's happening right now. Part of that is going to be using authority to make the case. So doctor, this doctor comes on. So you can see lots of doctors and lots of scientists who are going to come out and say, um, well, yeah, here's the case. And by the way, I'm an expert because I'm an expert in genetics. Yeah. Or Let's I'm going to look at my title. Yes. Yeah. I'm an obesity doctor or look at my stethoscope. So the authority yeah. is going to be used to make it seem like it's not propaganda, like this is this is this is real. This is the deal. And oh my God, no wonder it's so hard. And no wonder I've I've never been able to really successfully solve this. The the next step, which isn't happening yet, but it will be, is they're gonna make just simple obesity, so just being obese or being overweight, a medical disease. So it will no longer be that you're obese, which contributes to disease. It's going to be obesity is a disease. Mm. That'll be the next step. Once obesity is a disease and it's established 
medically is a disease. Now that now it's, opens now the door. Now it's go time to make yes. as much drugs as we can to help that disease. That's right. Mm-hmm. Now that it's a disease, insurance companies will cover new drugs. Pharmaceutical companies will see this new market. So anytime a new market opens, then the pharmaceutical company goes, oh my God, by the way, uh, what percentage of Americans are overweight? Like, what is it, 60%? Obese, I think it's 40%. So a majority of America is now your market. Mm -hmm. And this is a growing market, by the way. It's not a market that's like stagnant. More and more people are becoming obese every single year and kids are becoming obese. So this is no, this is a, a, a market that is not limited to old people like Alzheimer's or, you know, it's, or just women like ovarian cancer. This is a market that's everybody, men, women, and children and old, young, whatever, huge, huge market that's going to open up. And then what that does is because that market will be open, pharmaceutical industry then will take investment dollars and they now feel confident spending money on this particular thing. Whereas before to get a prescription for obesity by itself, kind of hard, once it becomes an official disease, you go to the doctor, they weigh you. It'll be this, it'll be this simple. They'll weigh you. Your BMI is this. Oh, here's your 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 prescription. Here's your prescription. Can you look up Doug, what category of pharmaceuticals is the most profitable or makes the most you know annual revenue because here's the next prediction i'll give you is that i think it's going to pass everything everything mm-hmm. i think that it'll be the biggest yes market we have yet to see in pharma so yes. you talk about cancer being probably a, mm-hmm. a, a massive one i would imagine I, I bet you money that this one will grow to be as big or bigger than something as prevalent as cancer yes. because of how many how many people are going to attach this to and and it opens the door for basically Anything that improves any sort of cognitive function, anything that helps speed up your metabolism, anything that suppresses your appetite, anything yes. that anything that can can yeah. show in a study sleep, that it improves yeah. any of those things can now be prescribed as a a drug to help this disease. Yes, and it's boy, is it gonna it's gonna be wild, dude. What would be interesting to see is how fast this happens. I mean, is it going to be, I mean, we, we see the news and the information coming out right now. Is it within a year? I two wouldn't years? be surprised if it was within a year. This year, huh? I think it's going to, I think we, it's going to happen. Give me the, give me like the leaders, next year, like, Who's leading here? Beginning yeah. So year. the, I don't know how to even pronounce it. Is <laughs> these names for these pharmaceuticals are great. Zaralto. Well, what are they for? That's what okay, I'm Okay. Cor- coronary artery disease. Okay. Yep. Uh, another one is for cancer. Okay. Those uh, are the top two. Yeah. So heart disease, cancer, top yeah. two. Yeah. Uh, ophthalmic treatment, which is for eyes, I guess. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a number of them that Look, it, right, brought in billions and billions I'm, of I'm gonna dollars. I'm going to say this right now. The list is endless because there isn't a single health issue that obesity doesn't make worse. Right. And that's why I think this thing is going to be massive. And there's not, there is so many things uh, naturally and pharmaceutically that you can take that can improve cognition or in, in, in appetite suppressing type things or speed up metabolism. There's so many things that you can attach to that. So it just and makes it, the side effects that you can now have drugs to, uh, caddy, you to know, that. you just, just an br- endless amount. You just brought up a, a phenomenal point, Adam, that I didn't even consider is current drugs that are out there that could be now used off label, which often happens right. to work with obesity because one of the side effects is weight loss or one of the side effects is appetite oh, wow. suppression. Oh, wow. yes. What a great, what a great observation. A hundred percent. So you've now not just opened up a market for new potential pharmaceutical drugs. You can rebrand other drugs. You've opened up markets for your current drugs for just being overweight. Holy cow. I mean, look from, from a business standpoint, <laughs> this is brilliant. Because oh, if I'm a pharmaceutical business, I'm getting excited right now. Oh my God, you've just you've just quadrupled your revenue. I mean, like overnight, as soon as and and, and you know, when a doctor says, "Oh, this is the official diagnosis now. This is what we got to say," they're going to look at their patient list. Think about this: how how many doctor visits and hospital visits do fit and healthy people have on an annual basis versus people who are obese? Mm-hmm. So right. if you're a doctor, besides physicals and stuff like that. The patients that you see the most, probably a greater percentage of them than the normal population are obese. So now you're a doctor, you see these people on a regular basis because they're coming in because they're not that healthy. And now you're like, oh, yeah, well, they're also overweight. Boom, let's slap that on. Oh, and that, this getting them to lose weight will also help. Can you way easier conversation than telling them about diet and nutrition? Can you you guys also imagine? Exercise nutrition. 
how powerful these ads are in comparison to ads. So right now when you see like a, you know, a Cialis commercial, the guy's sitting in a bathtub with a smile, <laughs> right? And like they, they, they're trying to paint this picture for you. You have to imagine what he's feeling or whatever. Like you don't get to see the physiological change as the person watching this commercial. Yeah. yeah. When it is connected to obesity and fat loss, before and after, we know how popular, how powerful before and after pictures oh my are God. in our industry. Oh, yeah. You are literally going to be like, oh my God, that's me. Like I struggle with those things. And then all of a sudden, boom, after and see the after picture. So less to pro. Yeah. Dude, it's the the Whatever the ability to sell that in comparison oh my God, to any crazy. other pharmaceutical I can think of. I just, I don't know if there's anything that is as power, that will be as powerful. It's going to be crazy. I totally can see. So like Planet Fitness did a fantastic job with how they like demonized sort of like the bro aggression part of the gym. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, uh, I just see that as being an angle for them to like create this like, you know, crazy, like aggressive, toxic environment, you know, uh, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm finally going to get my things together. And then be like, ah, you know, that's, that's too much. And then they go home and take a pill and then or it'll be, fine. or it'll just be like, you know, it'll show someone I tried exercise. I tried diet and nothing worked. Yeah. yeah. And then I tried, you yeah. know, whatever drug yeah. and I lost 20 pounds. And then you're going to see their picture. Yeah. It's gonna be... And I'm enjoying, and I can eat like I, I don't have to change my diet. And yeah. by the way, they are, there are drugs out there that are showing some weight loss effects. There's new drugs on the, on the horizon that are showing some of these, but as we've talked about in, in other episodes, they're not going to give you nearly the breadth of, uh, you know, benefits as changing your lifestyle, both psychological and physical. And I'm, I'm not against, by the way, medications that help certain people. But we know what's going to happen here if this becomes mainstream. Yeah, it's not going to make people healthier. It's not. No. It's it, we're going to get worse. Yeah. Things are going to get uh, much worse. Well, my view might be a bit different if it was just in the clinical setting, treating like a morbidly obese. Well, that's still you can do that now. Yeah. Right? So I, I mean, that's to me, if it's life changing, life saving at that point versus this is being marketed to everybody, kids, you know. Well, like, look. I'll, Everybody. I'll give you guys some of the most popular drugs. I'll give you, I'll say to you, you know, hey, Adam, go out, walk around the street, find 10 people that you could sell this antidepressant to. Or I said, hey, Adam, go walk around, find 10 people who you'll sell this weight <laughs> yeah, loss yeah, drug to. Yeah, yeah. Easy. Whoa. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. One after another would be no problem. I mean, that's why I think it's going to be the, the biggest market we've ever seen. I mean, mm -hmm. look at how, look how much money is in the supplement oh, industry. Yeah. For weight loss. Yeah, I know. And it's and not even work. And it's not <laughs> FDA regulated. It doesn't yeah. work. But yet look how much money is made in that. What do you think is going to happen when the, the most powerful companies with the most money backing them and the government as their friend yeah. is going to just imagine what they're going to do, dude? Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny Dad to me. Dad says it's good for you. It's uh, funny to me, too, because, um, I mean, you know, they could change, for example, the design of cities so people are encouraged to walk more. They could change advertising when it comes to advertising food to children. They could change education. Um, all those things would 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 be lifestyle based, but again, they require you know more choice and more empowerment. And it doesn't make a lot of money. It just doesn't make a lot of money. We should talk about what's caused the dramatic rise uh, in obesity, and really, it, it, and it's much more complex than what I'm about to say. But there's two factors here. One. We eat too much, duh, right? We just eat too much. But then people ask, well, what do you mean? Like, we've always eaten. How come all of a sudden we eat too much? Is it because we have so much more food? No, not necessarily. You know, that I'll go back to the statement that that doctor made on 60 Minutes where she said it's our brain. And our brain is telling us how much we need to eat uh, in order to keep ourselves alive. And if our brains are off, she says, right? Essentially, this is what she's implying. If your brain signals are off, then you'll be eating uh, way more food than you need. Okay, the food industry has figured out how to do this. Yeah, with we've been ultra saying, we've processed. Been, we've foods. been saying this forever. Yeah, ultra processed foods are designed oh. and engineered to get your brain to tell you that you're not full mm -hmm. when you should be full. To get your brain to make you want to eat more. Now, this isn't just me saying this, by the way. The, the studies, and these are the, by the way, these are some of the best studies done on nutrition. One of the challenges with nutrition studies is they're either observational, which is tough because people come back and report, which is always inaccurate. Yeah. Or they're done in settings that are just not realistic or small sample sizes. So it's really hard to kind of parse things out. But the studies on ultra-processed foods are amazing. They'll take groups of people. It's my favorite studies. They'll take groups of people, put them in rooms. Group A, group B, you're in a room monitored. Macros are accounted for. 
proteins, fats, and carbs, percentage foods, okay? Very similar. This group over here, ultra processed foods. This group over here, whole natural foods. And then they'll say, just eat as much as you want. And they'll watch them. And then they'll take the groups and have them switch rooms. So just in case they had a group over here that tends to overeat and over here that tends to undereat, they had them switch. Mm -hmm. On average, people consume 600 more calories a day with ultra processed foods. So these foods are making your brain tell you to overeat. Do you think that processed foods could have influenced our genetics like nothing we've ever seen before? Because one, one of the arguments against the this obesity gene argument is that as humans, we don't evolve that fast. We didn't go, we, we can't, it's like, uh, you know, just because all of a sudden all of us pick up swimming and stuff like that, we grow fins within 20 years. <laughs> you know. Like it, that wouldn't happen, no, right? It takes we, a long time. We a very long time. I've seen water world. Right, for that, for something like that to happen. So this idea that, you know, just a hundred years ago, nobody was really obese or a very, very small percentage to all these people is this, is genetics are to blame is like, okay, well, you don't understand evolution very well because it takes a very long yeah. time for something to be that, that much of a dramatic shift in like our metabolisms or how our body operates. But we also have never lived in a time with us, you know, consuming so much of these processed foods and the chemicals that we're going, which I know people get triggered by using words like chemicals because everything is technically a chemical. But I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we have now attached to negative outcomes from intaking so much of these certain chemicals. At the very least, these chemicals are put in there to make you overeat. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and so we agree on that. I don't think anybody doesn't uh, believe that processed foods somewhat hijack your body's ability to do that and make you want to overeat. Anybody who's ate junk food knows what that feels like. So is it possible for a generation of somebody who grew up on processed foods and that's all you ate your whole life and then you have a child that that those foods actually could have potentially influenced their genetics uh epigenetics no that's not just a chance i mean that's that's a, that's what's happened yeah. so when you eat these foods your brain rewires itself and the reward systems change and you find that you crave them more and more um not unlike a drug like you take a drug you get your dopamine hit you build up a tolerance, you need more of that drug, you have a stronger craving for it. So, and they've done studies on this where people will eat certain foods and then want more of them, even though they feel worse. And then because they feel worse, they want more of them. So yes, it changes how you crave things. Look, if you eat candy all the time, go eat some fruit. It's bland. A strawberry, a grape, a banana <clears throat> tastes bland if all you do is eat candy. Yeah. Now avoid candy for six months, then go eat a piece of fruit. And all of a sudden, it's bursting with flavor. Anybody, who, you competed in bodybuilding. You've talked about this all the time. So, yeah. yes, definitely. However, I will say this. With hard evolution, not epigenetics, but where you're like, hard genetics really change, the opposite would happen. We wouldn't evolve to become obese in, in 100 years. If we go down this path 10,000 years from now and we allow evolution to, ha to take over, meaning we don't fix ourselves through, you know, advances in technology and stuff. We just let people die who are obese and get heart disease. What'll end up happening is we'll actually evolve to, get more to have fast metabolism. Yeah, more resilient. And right? become resilient. Yeah. So it's not it's not what they say. Like we didn't evolve to become unhealthy. Yeah. That's not how it works. We would be evolved to how be How much more do resilient. they attribute to like in terms of like your gut flora and how that gets affected in terms of your cravings and then, you know, how that influences because it has an impact on, you know, the way that that access to the brain. Well, your 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 gut flora changes with the food that you eat. So if you change your diet, forget ultra processed foods and junk food. You just go from low carb to high carb or carnivore to vegan or whatever, your gut flora changes right away. But then we have things like antibiotics um, and, and chemicals present in our environment that tend to change our gut flora. That's an evolving science. I was going to say the problem right. with the gut, the gut science is it's just too, it's still too yes. broad and vague. It, it, everything changes it. Yes. Healthy food changes it. Yeah. Different diets change and, it. And look, and you so, can repopulate it. So it's, yeah, but it's still, it's a factor that there's a lot of new science around, but right. that's, you know, that's something too that's contributing. Now, what the problem is, is they're looking for this silver bullet issue that they could fix with the pill. Of course. When in reality, it's you overeat, which is complicated. So it's not just, yeah, yes, overeating is simple. But what causes you to overeat your relationship with food and yourself and the kinds of foods that you choose to eat, um, you know, how you use food, like all that plays a role. And I'm not going to minimize that. That's how huge, it's very complicated and challenging. And then there's also, we just don't move enough. We don't have enough muscle. Our hormonal health is off as a result of that, which also contributes to this. So those are, and that's also complex, right? Because if you do the wrong kind of workout, beat yourself up, do it for the wrong reasons, you won't want to do it. You'll slow your metabolism down, hurt yourself. And it just feels like way too much work for a little bit of a, a of a return. 
So, but again, to simplify, uh, we overeat and we don't move enough. Now it's much more complex when you look deeper, but look, uh, we've all worked in this health space for over two and a half decades. I've personally worked with people and seen them permanently, permanently stop the cycle of obesity, mm -hmm. permanent forever. Still I'm in contact with these people yeah. and they never gained a pound back through proper lifestyle change and through good coaching mm -hmm. where I got good later on as a trainer, probably my first five to seven years, I wasn't very good, but I had to figure out how can I help these people make these permanent changes, not just don't eat as New much pattern and behaviors more. that you establish. And that's, that's right. That does take a lot of work. That's right. And the growth that happens through that and the feeling that you get from being able to do it on your own. And then the ability to navigate the modern world in a healthy, balanced way where you don't feel you know, uh, like you're oppressing yourself or restricting yourself because the same doctor in that 60 minutes thing is like, it's not an issue of willpower. I hate that because it paints the picture that if you're obese that or obese people, well, all they need to do is like white knuckle it their whole life. It says you're powerless is what yes. it says. Yes. Say, making a statement. I mean, that's why I think that the wrong argument is to try and this is why I don't like even in our space when, you know, and I know some people love this. They love to pit each, uh, you know, us and somebody else against each other. And let's get in a, you know, PubMed war yeah. who studies more. And it's yeah. like you lose the the real root cause of the issues when we are arguing in the, about these controlled studies. It's like the same thing goes in this situation. Like, it's not like. If trust me, if the if the government's involved in it, pharmaceutical companies in it, there's going to be some research and studies to help support their argument that's going to be floating around like crazy. And so you're going to have these two two sides of this that are going to be arguing over whose science is more correct, and none, neither one of them are really addressing the root cause and or how you would solve the problem if it was your child. If yeah. it was your child and you wanted the best for them, is that how you would communicate this message? And I don't know. I think if you're a good parent, it, the, it's an easy answer. It's no, yep. I would and never if, tell my, my, my son. And I use the, the disability thing as an example, because to me, either way, I would communicate that in a way to empower him and tell him that he can do anything he can put his mind to, yeah. even if physically he is at a massive disadvantage advantage as everybody else focus on what you can control yes right yeah. i would definitely not be like and, and yeah you're fucked you're probably never going to be able to do small any steps. of those things son and, that you want to do in life and, because yes. you you don't have the the tools that everybody else has and along those lines if yeah. you're a parent and your child is dealing with this one of the most effective permanent ways you could help your kid is to do this yourself well th this is the scary part yep. is that there's going to be a whole host of parents that get on board with this stuff and you're not you're you're not going to just fuck up you. You're going to fuck up the next generation coming up because they're going to learn from their parents. They've they're already gonna, done this. Yeah. They've, they're, I shared an article in a previous podcast where the medical association now is approving weight loss drugs for children yeah. to help them with this uh, with this issue. So, look, the, the whole stay the, awake, man. The whole goal is to call this out so people see it. They can they can recognize the propaganda, recognize the twisting of the data, and not become a victim of the pharmaceutical industry, not become a consumer uh, and a, a, you know somebody who spends money on them because you've been lied to or because you believed in their lies. And that's just the bottom line. Look, if you like this show, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was hardest. for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 